Hey guys, Darren back again. I've got the TS100 in front of me, just a little soldering iron that's available off the Chinese websites. Um, it's a good little iron actually, it's very good, very powerful and very fast. Um, I'm not going to do a review, I'm going to instead show you the power supply configuration I've been using and we're going to improve that solution a little bit throughout the video. So what I've got here is just an old laptop power supply that I had kicking about. Um, this one's a Lenovo lap, laptop charger, but what's perfect about this one is it outputs 20 volts. So if you can see the voltage output right about there, you'll see that it's 20 volts DC output and you know, a solid three and a quarter amps. So that's quite a powerful output. And with these TS100s, they actually support you know, I think, you know, 12 to 24 volts or thereabouts. Actually, it says it right there on the side. Yeah, 12 to 24 volts. So if we look carefully at the side, we've got DC. Um, what that means is 5.5 millimeters by 2.5 millimeters. The diagram shows us that it's center positive and it's anywhere from 12 to 24 volts DC. So, you know, it would make a lot more sense uh, for, from a usability perspective to use the, the high end range of that voltage. It'll just make things uh, heat up a lot faster. So we're gonna aim for the 20-ish volt range. So coming back to this power supply, we've got 20 volts DC output at three and a quarter amps. So that's, that's, that's huge. So I like laptop power supplies because they're just made quite well, they're high quality. That's what we're going with today. So it does work. I've just got a little right angle connector on it at the moment um, and it heats up. This is a, obviously a custom firmware. I'll discuss the custom firmware a bit later on. I'll show you how to download it and flash it. Um, we're getting 19.9 volts coming in with 20 volts, there you go. Um, and just that quick, we're heating up to high 300s. So it gives you a little countdown there on the end, about 44 seconds to full temperature. Once this has come up to full temp, like it's already radiating heat, once this has come up to full temp, it holds it very well. Um, and the great little irons actually. But the purpose of this video is probably not to review it or anything, it's just the functionality. So I initially put this right angled connector on and it's not very good because it sort of gets in the way. So what I want to do today is fit a straight connector, but also um, also fit more of a flexible solution, like a, a flexible cable solution. So what I've picked up is actually a nice silicon cable off the internet um, for a tattoo gun, believe it or not. So this is a, a very flexible, very nice soft silicon DC cable. Uh, and it's for, for a tattoo gun. So they do, you know, tattoo work and they're gonna need the same sort of thing we're gonna need, a cable that doesn't get in the way. And this one's got a nice spring on it like that and the, the cable just flops out of the way. It doesn't impact the, the gun at all. So I thought this was perfect. Um, this whole bit of cable was about $4. So what we're gonna do is this end will ultimately have the DC jack on it. Um, we could unscrew it all we can cut this off, solder on our connector, and then maybe pad this up with a bit of electrical tape or something and screw this connector back over it. And we'll get a reasonably nice finish on this end. And then we can use the spring. So that's kind of the plan there. And the other end is just some weird connector for the, the tattoo machine or whatever. So we're just gonna cut that right off and we're gonna join that on to the original power supply just as a direct splice like that. So that's the plan. Then we're gonna have you know, the length of the power supply, the standard laptop one. We're also gonna have the extension of this silicon one. So we're gonna have a lot of length and I think it's gonna work quite well. I can just leave this plugged in uh, over the back of the workbench and run the silicon one up when I wanna use the soldering iron. So that's that. And also in shot here, you've probably noticed a new soldering tip. Um, you know, Make sure it's for the TS100. This particular one is a large chisel tip. And if you look at the, if you look at the internet, you'll see the models that are out there. Typically the iron get, comes shipped with the TSB2. 
It's just a little pointy one, which is okay. But I wanted to go a much larger tip for heat penetration. So I went with the largest one, the TSK. And it's also a nice chisel, so it's quite quite handy to use. So I'll just quickly show you that. So it's a nice big chisel tip and plenty of heat penetration. And we've still got a nice point, so we can still do fine work with it. So I think these are actually a good pickup. Uh, I've kind of moved to ch the chisel tips in general these days. I think they're just a really nice tip. So, you know, we may as well fit that straight away. Just pull the little stand off the iron. Just back off our top uh, Allen key screw, which I've already done. That's cooled down now. Just pull it out. Fit our new one. And tighten the screw back up. So that's that. That's fitted, ready to roll. Um, you can still rotate it into the correct position. So we'll do it about do it about there. So we can do a nice angle. Okay, so that's ready to go. I'll put the old tip aside. Refit our stand. Now these stands, they generally come in the box. So don't stress over these. They come in the box when you buy the iron. And it's just a nice little stand. I forgot to mention that uh, when I bought this uh, extra tip, the lovely people in China who sent this to me actually sent a ground strap with it as well. So that's the ground lead, which just uh, clips on to the top screw up here with a ground symbol. And you can just uh, clip that onto your, your work board or whatever, or to, you know, to your console to ground yourself. So that's, that's a nice little extra. I better roll the credits because I kind of forgot to roll them. So quickly roll the credits and we'll get started. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna to need to do is either cut this off or just desolder it. Um, might just try and desolder that actually. So just using my original soldering iron, let's just pull that off. It wasn't even crimped on. See if we can get that off. There we go. So we can throw that old tip away. Um, actually, I'll keep using this, that's really handy. So we're gonna, not gonna need that bit of plastic. We'll leave this on and we need to thread this on. Um, probably just have to do, can we do two wires at a time? It's a bit tight actually. Very tight. Kind of twist and push at the same time. It should eventually go through, I think. Otherwise we might have to cut it. Okay, so we're almost there. Uh, let's see if we can, well, we've got the main wire, that's fine, but let's see if we can get this second wire. There he is, okay. Now we can straighten them out. All right, that was actually pretty fiddly. It's a really snug fit on that, but we eventually got it. Um, what you could do is just cut this strain relief off and just feed it into the base if you kind of get stuck with that step. But let's see now the fitment of this. So it's actually not too bad. We're only off by a few millimeters. So. We can definitely pad that gap with just some electrical tape, which we'll do when the job's all soldered up. And then the threads inside this metal or aluminium casing should cut into that tape nicely. And we should come up to, you know, right up there and it should be pretty good. So that's our plan. So let's put our wires on. At this stage, we've got nothing connected to the other end so we can deal with the polarity later. But for right now, let's just get them soldered in place and we'll, we can crimp them in place. Uh, so one goes up to that tab there. One obviously stays low. Hope I didn't damage the wires. So if there's any risk of damaging the wires, it's probably a good idea to cut them and start with fresh wires. I think I might actually do that because I might have damaged some of the, um, the 
conducting fibers inside. So just let me do that. Gee, this stuff's really rubbery, this silicon. Just pinch that off. Pinch this one off. Give them a bit of a twist. Crimp it in place and solder it underneath. That should be fine. So I'm just going to squeeze that to crimp it. That'll hold it. And we can just solder it underneath on the bottom of the connector. That's completely fine. Bit of heat. Heat first and solder second. Really let, let that penetrate. That should be good. You actually don't need to um, get them through the holes. It doesn't really matter, but... Ooh, something just fell apart in the background. But we will. We'll just sit it right about there. Let's heat. Add solder. And let, the, let it really soak in. There it goes. Okay. Perfect. So you see how with these type of connectors, the solder sometimes just blobs on top. Sometimes it takes a little while for the heat to build up for the solder to actually penetrate the joint. So you kind of want to wait for that. Um, yeah, just a couple of seconds there really makes a big difference. Okay, so now we've got our connectors on. That one's crimped beautifully, that's no problem. That will still slide over the top. So let's do that. We don't, know, we don't need any uh, heat shrink tubing inside here because it's all insulated and they're staggered. So there's no risk of, um, there's no risk of short circuiting in there. Okay, so that's our connector. Could actually put a little bit of Loctite um, inside that as you screwed it together. It's probably not a bad idea just to keep the joint together, but I'll see how it goes for now. I might, I might pull it apart again if it breaks or something. So that's that done. That's, that's a nice factory joint. And then this one, which is a bit of a hack job, um, we'll put over the top. So we'll get our electrical tape, just a standard bit of electrical tape. And we just want to clean that first so the tape sticks. So let's just give that a quick spray with isopropyl alcohol. Um, we'll just wipe it on our sleeve because we haven't got anything here. we cowboys. Cowboys around here. Just let that dry off a little bit. And we'll grab our tape. Now you want to do the tape in this direction so that when we're finished, the tape will finish this way, and the way we can screw on with the direction of the tape. That's what I want to do anyway. Otherwise, you'll catch catch the edge of the tape as you're trying to uh, screw the cap on. So, just put a few a few layers of tape on. Probably more than what we need is better to start with. We can always take some off. Do a nice neat cut and kind of wrap that up like that. Then as we, if we look at our edge, it finishes there. Then as we screw our, there you go, that's pretty good. We screw our aluminium cap on, it screws with the direction of the tape and it bites in really nicely. So that's already getting really tight. It's a bit too tight actually. So I'll, I'll back that off and I'll take off, I'll take off a layer, but it's too much, just a little bit too much. So take off a layer back to about there. Try that again. So we've kind of, yeah, so we've kind of backed out a little bit on the end here. So yeah, well, I think what I will do is while I'm here, just get a bit of Loctite. Just a tiny bit of Loctite on that thread. And then as we screw the whole thing back together, Yeah, 
Yeah, it's really tight, actually. So we end up with something like that. We've got our cable coming in through the springy part. We've got the outer casing clamped on with tape and the connector inside with Loctite to hold that all together. So we'll just let the Loctite set. These little Chinese connectors aren't the best quality. So I think actually Loctite or super glue to really hold that in is a good idea. Um, I'll let that set and we'll move on to the other end of the cable. So I actually added a drop of super glue as well. So I probably shouldn't have put the Loctite on. Probably super glue is what you need there just to lock that whole inner casing together. Um, and I've actually plugged it in just so it's all perfectly aligned. And we're just gonna move that over out of shot and let that set. So it doesn't take long, but I'd rather not bump it while it's setting. So let's now focus on the other end of the cable. Um, so these things are useless. Let's cut them off. I just go straight in the bin. I'll never use them. Strip this back. Uh, there's some sort of um, tubing on that, which is fine. While we're here, we really should find a bit of heat shrink tube for this end. Uh, so this is my odds and ends box. You know what? That bit of blue might do it. Let's take a look at that. Does that fit? It just fits. So there you go. Well, that can stay on or whatever. Let's slide this up. So that's gonna be a really nice bit of heat shrink. Uh, ultimately, we're just gonna do this. So we do need to heat shrink that, keep that together. So I'll desolder this end. Uh, and you might be wondering what this big lump is. So on good quality power supplies, you generally see these and they're called ferrite beads. They just help to clean the voltage uh, a little bit because you know ultimately it is coming in via AC from the wall. There's AC to DC conversion going on inside the unit, but there's always a little bit of ripple on the DC line, uh, and this just helps to reduce that ripple. In fact, if you look closely at the DC symbol itself, you'll see that it actually has ripple in it. So you look right there, you'll see 20 volts and a straight line over a dotted line. That represents uh, regulated DC. So the dotted line is what we're kind of talking about. It's pulsating DC. So anyway, they just these things are good things. Try to keep these in series in your voltage lines, uh, in your DC lines if you have them. It's no big deal if you don't. So we could cut that off, but yeah, we're not left with much cable, but we should be okay. So first things first, let's take this apart. Right, that one's out. On second thoughts, let's just cut that guy. Just a bit hesitant because there's not much length left, but you know, we might just have to start fresh here because I've kind of butchered that, haven't I? So let's, uh... yeah, we really don't have much length. That's what she said. Well, I hope she didn't say that actually for your sake, but let's crack on. We've definitely done ourselves a mischief. It's a bit messy, isn't it? Um, let me just get my wire strippers and I'll take that off properly. Okay, so we've got these big strippers. Let's see if we can just rip the casing off. Yeah, okay. That helped a little bit. What you've got to be really careful with is you look closely, there's a few stray fibers. So the outer casing is the negative and you Got a few stray fibers there, so you do not want to let them uh, go and be loose because that's the sort of thing that can short out your work. Just double check that you do in fact have that completely separated and there's no loose strands. So there's a few loose strands around the back there, but they're all going to be okay. So we'll, we'll then twist this up and we should have a nice conductor there that's not going to short. So just really take your time on that. Make sure it is a very clean connection. Um, no loose strands. And one can be shorter than the other, which is gonna be naturally that length. And one can be a bit longer. I kinda like to stagger joints sometimes, just to uh, separate them a little. We know this is negative, we know that's positive, right? But on this end, 
We don't know. So first things first, let, we'll double check everything. Okay, so to determine our polarity of these wires and to connect them up in the, the right way, we know that this power supply is a center positive output from the diagram. And I'm 99% sure the positive will be the white one and that will be the negative, but we will check that. We'll just do a quick voltage check, check across that. Um, but what's more important is we need to work out on this end, we just need to measure the center pin and work out the corresponding wire at the other end, just so we can connect the correct one to the positive. So to do that, just grab your multimeter, put it on logic, which is a continuity test. Grab your leads and your leads should beep when it's a complete circuit. So put one lead in the center pin like so. Grab your wire. So one ends on center. So one of these will beep that one and not that one. So we know this one is our positive. So grab hold of that. And what I like to do to just to remember which one's positive is to make the other one a bit physically shorter. So we've now got one positive, one negative. Look, while the multimeter's out, let's flick over to, to DC volts. We'll plug our power supply back in, make sure we've got no shorts. And I think we're gonna have negative on the outside and we're gonna have positive in the center, which we do. So 20 point something volts, which is correct. If we got that the other way around, just for demonstration, it'll still measure 20, but it'll be negative 20. And you can see that there. So that's how you tell. So we're correct on our assumptions there. This end needs to be joined. So we've got our longer lead, which is positive, has to go to the white and the shorter one needs to go to the negative. So we'll trim these again. So let's now probably start with the negative because it's a short wire and the, the most difficult to get right. As long as it's nice and shiny, that's pretty good. Now there's a bit of a bit of a wire hanging off that edge there, so we're going to trim that. And we're going to trim that bit there too. Take that sharp point off it if we can, like that. So that's joined fine. Now what we're going to do also, which I didn't mention, is we're going to put another little bit of heat shrink tube just on one of the wires, which is going to be the positive, just to protect it from the other wire and then put this right over the, the top. So we just need another bit of junk. We may as well use red for positive. That should fit on nicely, which it does, and cut them to length. Twist it up. Don't forget your heat shrink, put that on first. Might have to strip that back a little bit. So, you know, before you do your final soldering, always, always double check that you've got your heat shrinks in the right position. Um, it's gonna be a bit of a challenge actually to get that one right over everything, but we'll give it a go. Um, so these should come together. So we'll just give that a tin as well. Let it soak in. Just come underneath and give that one a bit of a tin. Okay, so that's all joined up. And just as before, we'll just trim off those sharp edges because they're the sort of things that can poke right through and cause shorts. Now, this is the fun part. So always kind of wait a few seconds for things to cool down because if you slide your heat shrink on too early, it'll just start to shrink. So quickly get that on into position. Um, use a hot air gun if you've got one, which I do, but I can't be bothered heating it up just for now. So you use the side of the iron, works really well. And just shrink that down. We can use the tip in there, that's okay. Just like that. And our wires will sit reasonably relaxed. And the fun part is to put this tubing all the way along. 
somehow. Yeah, so it's going to be a tight fit. That's what she said as well. Um, so more finagling. There we go. Oh, there we go. There we go. Looking good. So we got that all the way on and it's fairly neat. And that's it. We've got a reasonably clean joint. It's quite strong and we're in business. Okay, so we're ready for testing. A pretty nice socket and uh, spring on the end. So I've plugged this guy back in, plugged him in. We're all powering up nicely. So we've got our polarity correct. And let's uh, let this heat up and we'll give it a quick test run. So what are we on? 400, that's fine. So I won't run you right through these, the settings of the custom firmware, but basically you press and hold the second button here and it brings in brings you into the menu. So that's the version I'm running. I'm running uh, 2.05 and I'll, I will post a link to this in the description, so don't worry. Um, the flashing process is extremely easy. I won't even really demonstrate that. You just grab the file, you have it ready on your Windows machine, you plug in a USB connector to the back of the iron into your computer. It comes up as a drive on your computer and you just literally drag that file that you downloaded onto the drive. Um, let the iron do its thing. It can take about 30 seconds and it'll flash the firmware and then it'll, re, it'll disconnect the drive letter and then reconnect the drive letter. And once it's done, it gives you a little uh, status prompt. Uh, the file name changes in the drive letter and you're good to go. That is it. So read the instructions on the internet. It's pretty easy. Um, but back to the menu, you press and hold this second button and then you can just you know cruise through the settings. Um, you can change all sorts of stuff, you know, soldering settings, enable boost mode. That's really good. That's the overdrive. It'll let, just get, allows it to get a bit hotter. Boost temp, 420. Auto start when you pick it up. It's got a motion sensor in it. It's pretty cool. You can just start. Or you can turn it off. Um, sleep settings of timeouts. Uh, obviously Celsius and Fahrenheit. Display orientation. Default sort of left or right-handed. Cooldown sort of s status. Scrolling speed. Um, Detailed idle screen, detailed solder screen, factory reset it, calibrate temperature, input voltage. Um, oops, went the wrong way. And then back to the start. So it's pretty good, isn't it? But let's give this a test. Put an old junk board here, just a Master System 2. But we can use this to test a few things out. So. What are we up to? Well, it says it's already at 400. Let's give it a quick shot. So, look at that, wow, just like butter. That's amazing. You'll notice this screen keeps flicking up and down, left and right as well. It's, it's automatic left and right handed, which is really cool. So, it's another good feature of the custom firmware. You know, any one of these points, look at that, just melts it absolutely like butter. Um, this is the biggest one I can find on the board. This is absolutely massive. I don't think a normal iron could do this. And look at that, straight through, just like a powerhouse. It's pretty cool, isn't it? For a cheap soldering iron off of a Chinese website, these things are just amazing. So I'd highly recommend you pick one up. It solders brilliantly. Um, this now works quite well in my hand. I didn't even think about it just then as I was doing that test. It's now kind of dangles out of the way. The spring really helps. Um, it's more balanced in the hand, like it doesn't tilt forward. It just sits there quite nicely. And uh, this doesn't get in the way. I like the chisel tips. I think they're a really good uh, addition to pick up. Let's pick another point. Um, some big points up here. Yeah, look at that, just absolute butter. Just straight through. That is amazing. And, at the, and the temperature recovers so fast. So we may not even need um, 
400. We'll pull that down to 350. I don't want to stress the poor little guy out. Let's let him cool down. So 356, 355. Okay, so we're about there now. Let's see if we can get the same result. Yeah, we can. A fraction of a second longer. But there it goes, it still works. So, you know what, 350 is probably all you need on these. Uh, I know they go 400. I know they go quite hot. So, especially with the custom firmware, it actually lets you do a bit of a power overdrive on them. It lets you just crank in a bit more voltage. Very impressive little kit. So, grab yourself one of these. Um, get the larger tip, the TSK. And I think you're in business. Like, honestly, guys, for... Uh, not much money. I think it was $60 Aussie, um, probably 50 US. You can pick one of these up. I think the tip cost me seven or eight dollars extra. Um, let's just call it ten dollars. And you know these bits were like four dollars, and that was like that that DC tip was like ten cents or something. So the whole lot is extremely cheap, and you get a quite a robust little soldering iron. Um, I'm probably going to make another adapter like this but with um two alligator clips on the end for around the car like with you know connect it straight to the 12 volt battery won't be as responsive as this but it'll still get the job done if i want to do some work on the car and i need to solder a wire so that's the plan there anyway so that's it guys like you know i hope that was sort of interesting that video um i probably rambled a little bit in this one as i worked this out but it's very simple it came together well i'm glad this solution worked out pretty well um, and I'm going to start using this more and more. I want to probably stop using the the China special over there. Um, it's just, it's good, but it's a bit old school and this just seems to work. So I'll leave the video there, guys. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.